Hello, my name is Marshall Kozloff, and I would like to welcome you to the fourth debate in the Diana Davis Spencer debate series. This series has been made possible with the generous support of the Diana Davis Spencer Foundation and is a partnership between the Intercollegiate Studies Institute and the Center for the Study of Government and the Individual at the University of Colorado, Colorado Springs. The purpose of this debate series is to promote the exercise of free speech and to provide a model of civic civil discourse and debate that will help us move forward in addressing the important issues of today. Today's debate is going to focus on the question of big tech and its influence in American life. As we've seen throughout the past weeks, this debate is one that consistently, consistently comes up in every single one of our lives. But is this influence dangerous for American society? And if so, how should we handle it? Today, we've brought two of the top minds in tech policy together to debate these questions and offer their own answers. Now, I'd like to introduce our debaters this evening and explain the format of our debate. We will start with Rachel Bovard, who will argue in the affirmative. Rachel has spent more than a decade uh, in Washington, D.C., fighting for conservative policies. She's now the senior director of policy at the Conservative Partnership Institute and served as the di legislative director for Senator Rand Paul, as well as the policy director of the Senate Steering Committee. She was also a director of policy services at the Heritage Foundation. She earned her bachelor's degree at Grove City College and also participated in a ISI reading group. <laughs> After that, she went on to receive her graduate degree from the George Washington University. Welcome, Ms. Bovard. Thank you. Secondly, we have Will Duffield. Will is a policy analyst at the Cato Institute Center for Representative Government, where he studies speech and internet governance. His research focuses on the web of government regulation and the private rules that govern America's speech online. He received his bachelor's degree from Sarah Lawrence and completed a master's in political theory at the London School of Economics. Welcome as well, Mr. Duffield. Thank you. And now the plan for the actual debate. First, we will start with Ms. Bovard arguing in her opening statement about the resolution. We will then proceed to Mr. Duffield after that as well, too. I will then ask several questions based on pre- research, but also their statements as well. And then we will go on to actually bring in questions from the audience as well, too. Now we will begin with the guest's opening session. Uh, Ms. Bovard, we'll start with you. Thanks, Marshall, and good evening, everyone. The ability to think, speak, and act without coercion or manipulation is central to Americans' common understanding of liberty and fundamental to our democratic consensus. Over the last two decades, we've seen a handful of major tech companies become the primary avenues in which the majority of our speech takes place, where views are shared and argued and where information is gathered. In just the last several years, we've seen these same platforms assert unprecedented control over what we can say and hear on what are now the primary avenues for our speech and information. But in just the last several months, we've seen these platforms collude with illiberal attitudes fostered primarily in the Democratic Party to act against speech that is deemed offensive. While it would be unconstitutional for government actors to suppress speech in this way, big tech is happy, even eager, to do it for them. This is censorship. There are those who will quibble with the definition that it cannot be censorship if it's not done by the government. But when major speech corporations are willing to turn off views they don't like, or when those same platforms become so dominant that they can shut down business over ideology, the argument that it is not censorship unless it is literally done by the government becomes one of purely semantics, because the effect is entirely the same. This makes clear that the real power is not necessarily with the government. It is with these entirely unaccountable corporate speech platforms who are now setting the terms for what constitutes the public square. Consider that Google filters information for 90% of America. This means that a single algorithmic decision by Google about what information to suppress or to amplify changes what 90% of the country sees. Facebook has a similar power for 2.7 billion active users. Amazon, the world's largest bookseller, can do the same by refusing to sell certain books or by telling their sellers they cannot sell those books on Amazon as well. This undermines free speech as we know it. In altering the flow of information at unprecedented scale, big tech is shaping and manipulating independent thought, which has downstream conse consequences on behavior, including on election outcomes. And so in this way, big tech is reshaping the boundaries of our social consensus. It's taking us, 
and our representative democracy out of the driver's seat and inserting itself. There are those who suggest, and Will may be one of them, that the ability to speak online renders the argument about viewpoint suppression itself moot. It goes like this. If you can say it on BitChute or Gab or on Mastodon or on some other dusty corner of the internet, then your speech and your views are not literally being suppressed. Or if Amazon kicks you offline, doesn't want to sell your book, a brick and mortar store can do it for you. Or if Facebook refuses to run ads for your business, you can still put up a billboard. But this is a narrow and reductive and frankly, I think, absurd argument that does not reflect the reality of what is happening. But more importantly, it fails to grasp the conception of free speech as Americans have always understood it. And that is, it's not just about who speaks. It is also about who hears. And because Google, Facebook, Amazon, and all these other platforms control the majority of where our discourse in America takes place, eliminating speech or views or books gives them the power to eliminate individuals or groups from what is now the public square. But as we recently learned, the power over big tech or the power big tech has is not actually just over the marketplace of ideas. It is also over the marketplace itself. In cooperating to deplatform Parler, Amazon, Apple, and Google demonstrated the power big tech has to eliminate a small business from the market. Without access to Google Play, which is Google's app store, or Apple's app store in particular, Parler is cut off from the oxygen a small business needs to survive. It literally cannot access the mainstream audience. Now, combine this with the recent actions by corporate America more broadly. Banks and credit card processes are denying services over viewpoints. A major online retail shop refuses to do business with the former president of the United States. Email providers are deplatforming tea party groups. Web browsers like Mozilla call for, quote, more than just deplatforming. Our major corporations in various sectors of the economy can, and now have, worked together to not simply deny service to individuals, but to deny groups of Americans access to public life. Just today, members of Congress held a hearing to pressure cable, satellite, and streaming providers to drop Fox, One America News, and Newsmax. And to be very clear, if these companies drop those networks, it is private actors doing this. It is not the government. It will be private actors that are taking entire businesses and points of view off the air. Big tech has so much power that it is able to rip away the guts and infrastructure of capitalism from those who now lack whatever they define as the correct political view. It actually removes the ability of people to make a living in America if they hold counter-narrative political beliefs. To those of us on the right, and I would also say to anyone who believes in liberty, this is anathema to everything we believe about what this country should be. The power concentrated in the big tech platforms are actively threatening the foundational values of a free society, the free flow of information, viewpoint diversity, and access to the free market infrastructure. William F. Buckley, in referencing the corporate titan of his day, which was General Motors, once surmised it in this way. He said, I will not willingly cede any more power to anyone, not to the state and not to General Motors. But I would also assert it is not just a battle over power, but for us, it's a battle about who rules. Because in America, the people rule, not the bureaucrats, not the mob, and certainly not the lords of Silicon Valley. The people acting through our self-government set the terms for how we live together. And it's time for us to take that power back. Thank you, Ms. Bovard. Mr. Duffield? Thank you. To start this evening, I will focus on concerns that technology firms do too much to limit or remove political speech. Although very different fears are politically ascendant, uh, fears about the relationship between the internet and democracy, I suspect this audience is less worried about algorithmic radicalization or unfettered conversation on Clubhouse. So, do some handful of firms exert enough control over American political decision making and discourse to preclude deliberation and democratic debate? The answer is an unequivocal no. Big tech is a category of convenience. In practice, it seems to apply to firms that make politically unpopular decisions. Twitter is far smaller than Facebook, but its popularity with political elites renders it big tech. 
Amazon is big tech, unless you're talking about its subsidiary, Twitch, which competes with YouTube. Snapchat challenged big tech until it removed President Trump's account, at which point it joined big tech. Retail investing app Robinhood became big tech when, at the end of January, it ran out of money to cover its users' trades for three days. Definitional deficiencies aside, the breadth and diversity of big tech illustrates the continuing dynamism of the American technology sector. Many of the firms I just mentioned didn't exist a decade ago. Far from a cabal or oligopoly, there exists a robust market in social media. Dominant firms are challenged by numerous upstarts and compete with one another across a variety of niche markets. Claims of particular political bias also come up short. This is not to say that social media platforms are well governed. Given their size, this is an essentially impossible task. But coverage of content moderation's inevitable shortcomings is far more lopsided than actual platform governance. Anecdotal accounts of bias abound, but most fall apart under scrutiny. Twitter's much ballyhooed shadow banning search error affected a half million accounts from across the political spectrum, including the hosts of leftist podcast Chapo Trap House. The removal of links to the New York Post's Hunter Biden story was misguided and heavy handed, but Twitter implemented its hacked materials policy after years of threats from Congress to do something about foreign disinformation, or Congress would. The policy was first applied to Blue Leaks, a trove of stolen police files released over the summer. Platform responsiveness to political pressure, critical journalism, and NGO advocacy campaigns may be a cause for concern, but this is ultimately a worry about the dominance of progressive values not tech firms. The logical response to this concern is structural decentralization, not state intervention as another layer of capturable centralized control. Despite the best efforts of gatekeepers old and new, protected by Section 230, the internet as a whole continues to route around censorship. By setting a speech floor no higher than the First Amendment, Section 230 encourages exit from stifling private rules. A little over a month after being barred from AWS, Parler is back online via web host SkySilk and domain registrar Epic, both of which rely on Section 230's protections. Relative to the previous status quo of Fox News versus the rest of cable or talk radio versus broadcast television, conservative voices have flourished on social media. For those whose beliefs don't fit neatly into the remit of either party, the internet has provided an even greater relative increase in reach. Scattered individuals can form communities of interest without regard for geography, like never before. More stringent community standards have not slowed this trend. Finally, a practical political concern. You may leave this lecture unswayed by my arguments for the value of the legal status quo and budding decentralized alternatives. You may still want a social media landscape governed by the First Amendment or informed by conservative principles. Unfortunately for these desires, the Democrats control the executive and legislative branches of government. Any attempt to amend Section 230 will prioritize Democrats' concerns. Every Democratic proposal for altering Section 230 would impose new responsibilities to moderate speech across the entire ecosystem. Any legislative remedy will apply to more than whichever firms are, for the moment, considered big tech, leaving no room for dissenting alternative platforms. Leading proposals would create liability for algorithmic suggestions and off-platform criminal acts committed by users. Holding Gab responsible for the Tree of Life synagogue shooting or dissuading Facebook from recommending protests will not make speech freer. This is an unavoidable barrier to legislative must-carry proposals. Those who desire more speech or take issue with process-deficient platform decision-making should take care not to feed ultimately illiberal reform efforts. What's bad for the platforms will be bad for speech, too. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Duffield. So we'll direct the first question to Rachel because a statement she issued during her opening really relates to the idea behind this segment. And then Mr. Duffield, I'd love to get your response to her statement. Do you believe that there was deliberate 
collusion and collaboration when it came to Parler's removal from the app stores, from Amazon Web Services. Did that naturally happen or did, or to use your language, was there a specific bit of collaboration that went on there? I do think cooperation and collaboration goes up on in between these platforms. I don't, you know, there's a legal definition of collusion that I'm unable to make an argument of whether that is met or not. But you see this multiple times. So once, you know, I think it was Apple acted first, you know, within 24 hours, Google followed suit. And then within 24 hours of that, Amazon, you know, the kneecapping was complete. We're also seeing it just this week with a book by Ryan Anderson, one of my former heritage colleagues, when it was taken off Amazon, within 24 hours, it was then removed from Apple uh, as well. You couldn't get on Apple Books and in multiple places down the line. Now, you know, I think we'll hit on something that I think is important, which is that a lot of this is sort of similar ideological stances. It's a, it's a prioritization of progressive values over conservative ones. I think those happen to be illiberal. But when you have it across these dominant scale, right? When you have these primary platforms being the one that all think a certain way, then yes, liberalism as a goal, small l liberalism is going to suffer. And so I do think there is some cooperation on this point, but I think more broadly, the problem is the dominant speech platforms all carry the same ideology. And I don't think that is good for the social consensus of the country. Um... So I think it looks much more like a cascade in practice. Rarely do you see one unified announcement that we have removed someone, but instead, once one actor or platform moves, I think it shifts the permission structure for everyone else. It becomes not a line that is held, but a race out the door. Um, I think the media often drives this. Um, reporting on some piece of content or, or speech is something that someone must do something about. And then once someone's done something, everyone else must follow their lead. But when we think about the power of these firms, it's worth recognizing that they're all running from something here when we see these cascades. And when I see everyone running, I tend not to think of their individual power, but instead wonder what they're all running away from, what has them so afraid. Um, and in, in these cascades, I, I think that's the proper question to ask. What's driven um, this very rapid shift in policy? What do you think drove that rapid shift? I, I think the events with Parler. I think the events of January 6th and the narrative that formed around Parler as the, the kind of be-all, end-all organizing platform, even though that was far from the truth. Rachel, you've spoken about this in a compelling fashion. Um, as I understand it, there were other platforms that also hosted conversations regarding violence on January 6th. To what degree does that represent a problem for Parler or does it represent for the space in general? So I think this is a key distinction. And because a lot of times when people defend what the, the actions taken against Parler, they do so on the basis of policy. Well, Parler didn't follow the rules, you know, and therefore it was justified in everything that was done to them. But when you actually, and the argument you know, that Will touched on is correct, the pretext was, well, they didn't follow the content moderation rules and thus were circulating you know, violent threats and incitement and all these things that led to January 6th. Then both the media narrative and the actions taken by these big tech companies pushed that fact. It was actually counterfactual. <laughs> when you go back and look at the 232 charging documents released by the Department of Justice, there are over 70 references to posts on Facebook, over 20 to posts on Instagram. So collectively Facebook, as well as YouTube, there are only eight references to Parler. So if the outcome was the goal here, if, the, if the, these platforms, the outcome was for them to stop circulating this content, they failed by taking Parler offline and the, when they actually should have aggressed against the larger platforms. And this is also true when you look at what these larger platforms get away with. The example I always use is, you know, horrifically, two years ago, three years ago now, Facebook was used to incite a genocide in Myanmar. This was very clearly done with face, you know, the government of Myanmar was able to use Facebook, which is almost indistinguishable from the internet in Myanmar to affect a genocide. And it's still happily unmolested in Apple's app store. You would think that would qualify for removal, but it doesn't. So this is not a policy choice. This is an ideological decision in which policy is rendered moot because it's not equally applied. I, I think there's actually a lot of crossover between the sorts of charges we saw leveled at Parler in the wake of January 6th and the narrative around Facebook and, and Myanmar. In both cases, we're expecting a platform, speech control, to stand in for physical security and to expect 
parlor to have, or any other website, to have prevented people from gathering in D.C. that day, or in Myanmar to expect Facebook to somehow intercede in, in the face of a military operation carried out by an essentially independent military in Myanmar that has since then taken over the entirety of the country. Um, well, we worry about Facebook being sovereign, but they aren't sovereign enough to go put troops on the ground in Myanmar and stop that from happening. Um, across the board, the expectations imposed on, on these firms, I, I think, are um, too, too much. Um, and we'll always end up, when, when we look to replace the physical security of the capital with speech controls, well, that's very hard to do with speech controls, and you're going to end up needing a lot more speech control to deliver similar results. Um, so moving down that path is a bad idea. Can I just add one thing? Because I think you're making an actually very an excellent point and one that is valid. We expect a lot of these platforms because these platforms are so dominant. But I guess my pushback against that is I would agree with you except that, you know, they enforce this expectation unequally. Right. They say they can stop some things, but not others. They say, you know, conservatives are causing all these problems, but similar of, you know, left wing violent content. Well, we, that goes, you know, unenforced against or vice versa. Right. So it's the unequal application of the standard that I think causes a lot of angst among at least on the right, which is where I sit. I think every time the standard is applied, perhaps unequally to one group or another, the standard itself grows. There's a lot of concern about cross-platform decisions regarding conservative content right now, and even the use of hash banks to capture domestic extremism or, or radical speech. That was all pioneered vis-a-vis -vis ISIS and other terrorist groups in the Middle East, and Western governments encouraged these platforms to work together, come up with a way of across the board, so someone couldn't creep up on the alternative platform and talk about ISIS, um, come up with solutions to take this stuff off once and for all. Um, and like everything else in our war on terror, eventually that comes home. A, a question that's coming out in this debate already is the question of fairness. During your opening statement, you made reference to an emerging world where we see decentralized platforms, smaller communities that operate on a different level. But as I'm thinking of a typical conservative that doesn't feel as if Twitter, or Facebook, et cetera, are fair, I think that to a certain degree, are you not telling conservatives they need to go off to a separate space that's outside of the mainstream, that's outside of the public square? Is it not possible that there are a lot of people who actually don't want something smaller, they don't want something decentralized, they just want to operate along with everyone else? I think there's, there's value in maintaining a backup, particularly if the current situation seems untenable. Um, I'm not asking conservatives to like Facebook's governance, but it is Facebook's at the end of the day. And in the face of concerns about it becoming unbearable, uh, it behooves those who find a problem with it to set up some alternative. Uh, Head Parler responded to the repeated complaints it got from Amazon um, and, and took seriously the idea that it might be knocked off AWS, as many other services have been in the past. Uh, they could have had no downtime at all. They could have stood up their own servers somewhere else and just avoided that whole month-long outage. Um, looking back to, to WikiLeaks in 2011, we saw essentially this whole story play out. Uh, Joe Lieberman, then, then Senator Joe Lieberman, pressured AWS to take WikiLeaks' site offline. Um, WikiLeaks disappeared for a couple weeks and then reappeared via a European web host. Um, payment processing has always been more difficult just because payment processing is more regulated. So while anyone can go and set up their own server and be the friendly web host, you can't just become a bank overnight. Um, back in, in 2011, WikiLeaks turned to a then um, much newer Bitcoin. Um, so we've, we've seen a pattern of, of response to these sorts of actions that, that's as long as the internet. Um, but never have they been done at this scale. And I think that this is part of the problem because, you know, people who say to conservatives, well, go build your own. This has been the refrain for years, right? I was sympathetic to that refrain until what happened to Parler. And I think it's flipped the whole narrative on its head because what it's shown us is that, 
you can go build your own and it can be successful. Parler was the first, I would say, main successful mainstream alternative to Twitter, which is the most susceptible to competition, I think, of all the platforms because of it's the smallest. And as soon as it got marginally successful, it was kneecapped by its competitors. Jack Dorsey tweeted out a heart of thank you <laughs> when it no longer appeared in Apple's App Store. And while, yes, it has resurrected itself on web servers, it is still not back in Apple's App Store or Google Play. And as I said in my opening statement, these are the two avenues by which any app, any social media app, it's the oxygen it needs to survive. It cannot access a mainstream audience without those two stores, without those you know, web uh, or without those mobile access points. Anyone can pull it up on their browser, on their phone. Just, it's accessible by any phone. Just now. But the, the metrics show this, right? That most people don't use the browser service. They use the app services. But my point is, again, it goes back to the double standard. It, it, what Parler taught us, I think, speaking as a conservative, is that whatever alternative we build, they will still come for us. So I think, you know, Democrats are already talking about taking down Signal, blocking encrypted chats, you know, chasing conservatives around the web because they do not want us to speak at all. And I think the second issue is this, and it kind of goes back to the issue of scale. These are the primary avenues of speech in America. We can disagree on this, but I very much think when Google decides to filter information for 90% of America, it's a dominant speech platform, same with Facebook. I don't necessarily, it goes back to the conception of what free speech is. I can go speak on a dusty corner of the unpopulated area of the internet. I am literally speaking, I'm not being suppressed, but nobody's hearing. And again, this goes back to the fundamental concept of how we view free speech. It is about persuasion, it is about engaging in the public square, it's about your ideas being valid and being heard. Now this wouldn't be a problem, again, if we had, you know, if Facebook or Google were doing this for 20% of America instead of the dominant, you know, they were the dominant player. But if you're not on Facebook and you're not speaking on it, then you're basically only speaking to, you know, a handful of people. And that's, I think, now this is more of a philosophical argument than maybe a policy one, but this is a very, it's very rooted to the problem at hand. A, a question that immediately comes to mind though, Rachel, speaking of conservative values, one would basically be the articulation of personal responsibility. At what point was the CEO of Parler not responsible for what happened there? For example, it was his decision to go on Kara Swisher's podcast to make provocative statements about content moderation. It was his decision to not take down content at a scale when it was quite clear that he had a target on his back to a certain degree. So how do you think about how that played out? Because I think the question I'd ask is, is it possible there's a scenario where a more competently run partner does not run itself into the situation and the CEO was removed for a reason, obviously? Yeah. It's a, that's a fair point. I, Parler obviously has agency here, but I tend to think that what happened would have happened to him anyway. Parler had a target on its back from the beginning because it was, again, a competitor and it was because a place where conservatives were speaking, which is we've now seen actual statements to the effect that that shouldn't be allowed. CNN called Parler a threat to democracy simply because conservatives are speaking online, not to, you know, not really a, 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 poly, a statement about content moderation. But I will say this. Parler was engaging in content moderation. There's you know, statements out there saying they were not doing it all, and, and I think John Matsey sort of propelled that narrative. But at the end of the day, they were trying to get a handle on what they wanted that moderation to be like. And I know this because a lot of the libertarians were actually mocking them for doing any content moderation. You know, they said, well, you're supposed to be the First Amendment platform. Why are you taking down you know, pornographic images? They wanted to engage, and they did engage. But I think you know, ultimately, they were a small business that was trying to scale up. If you're trying to tell me that Facebook didn't go through those same struggles and wasn't giving, given massive latitude by all these companies, Facebook would have been taken down at the same level as Parler for, for the same mistakes. There was a double standard applied to Parler, and I think it would have been taken out no matter what John Matsey said or did. Do you think that Parler was inevitably going to be deplatformed? I, I don't think so. Um, looking at, you, you say that Parler moderated, and they certainly did. They tried to create a space in which conservative principles informed governance. Uh, they tried to apply the First Amendment as best they could. Um, but this moderation wasn't what Amazon demanded of them as, as its customer. Amazon required them to moderate away statements or calls for violence. And up until three days before Parler began to be removed from app stores, you had Lynn Wood with 500,000 followers tweeting out that, that Mike Pence needed to be killed. And at some point, Amazon pulled the plug on that. And I don't think we can preclude Amazon from making those sorts of decisions about its service. 
again, I think it goes back to the quality of application, right? I mean, mm-hmm. Amazon doesn't host Pornhub, but it allows Pornhub to use some of its services. I would not say a lot of the things that happen there are great <laughs> either. So again, should Amazon be able to render these decisions? And were there back and forths with Amazon and Parler about this? Absolutely. But again, it goes back to the idea that I think they were extremely focused on Parler in a way that they may not have been focused on other companies. And it, you know, kneecapping them was part of the cascade that Will referenced. You know, it was Apple, then it was Google, then it was Amazon. At a certain point, this debate is really coming down to a definition and a debate over what the public is and what the private is. So to a certain point, Rachel, I could see someone saying, well, look, at the end of the day, they are not discriminating based on race, not necessarily discriminating based on sex. We could argue they're discriminating based on politics, but that isn't quite a protected class in the same way that these other categories would be. So to what degree do you think it's possible? So what, what is your response to someone who would say, look, Amazon could do what it wants with its platform as long as it's not discriminating against the protected classes? So I think this is a even a much broader conversation than speech itself, because I think the dawn of big tech and really the dawn of the digital age the private and public sectors no longer functionally exist as separate components. They are now merged. You have, you know, surveillance capital exists, right? All of these companies track us, um, have massive reams of data on us to the extent that we don't even know what it is sometimes that they do with it. Um, And now they are using that data they have on us to make decisions about how we will be treated. Right. Do we have access to, you know, certain services? You know, it's almost like a Chinese social credit system is developing. These corporations have so much data on us that I think any notion of privacy anymore, if you use these services, is a is a fiction. And you're already seeing this in, in ways that these companies collude with the government with our data. You know, this was the whole premise for well, one of the things that was really re- revealed by the Edward Snowden links, right, was how closely these companies were working with the government to allow them back end access to our photos, our emails, our voice recordings, you know, down the line. And, you know, you're, you saw this recently with Bank of America. You know, as soon as uh, the government wanted information on bank transactions for people that might have been involved in January 6th, warrant or no warrant, Bank of America was happy to do it. So the notion of public and private anymore has been entirely distorted. And if you want to bring speech into it, it goes back to kind of my opening statement in that I do very much think because of the scale of these companies, the content algorithmic decisions they are making is shaping independent thought, the information that people have access to, the viewpoints they see. All of that shapes at a scale we've never seen before how people think and act in America. Because even if I'm not using Facebook, Everyone around me is. And so my so my society is changing whether or not I use Facebook. And I think that is the fundamental problem I think that a lot of people are trying to grapple with. What do you think about the debate over public versus private? Well, firstly, on, on that last point that Rachel made, I'm not sure that's um, necessarily a unique result of, of Facebook. Um, that that Facebook could apply to... Facebook proxy. <laughs> well, but any, any kind of media that's consumed en masse... Um, I, I uh, shoot, what was the film that everyone in America had watched at one point? Gone with the Wind. Um, you know, we could level a, a similar accusation at, at Gone with the Wind, and it's shifting Americans' attitudes writ large at scale, coming into every local theater everywhere with this one narrative. Um, but at the end, that's a complaint about everyone else's consumption decisions uh, and everyone else's choice to use Facebook and build networks on it or speak through it. And so to then turn around and view that as as a problem to be solved through public policy just feels like jumping the shark. Um, In terms of that public-private question, I think if anything, the line right now that needs to be held is between more private forms of communication, be they your Discord group, some little server you stood up, an encrypted messaging chat, and mass public communication, one-to-many communication, which has been moderated since the dawn of the internet from a user experience standpoint. And that's always been the justification for moderation, not the political misinformation that might um, affect an election, but people's experience on the platform, people having an enjoyable time. And that's always kept this kind of intervention out of 
small private conversations because the assumption has been that if someone's there participating in a small group chat, they're enjoying it, they're happy with the subject of conversation, and they can leave if they're put off. Um, but this broader concern or reorientation of moderation towards really pr protecting the state um, has then given justification for moderators, um, be they human or algorithmic, to, to move into, to take on responsibility for much more intimate conversations. And I think that's a, a cause for concern, something to be pushed back against or physically secured against through technology. I'm really interested in your use of the term choice and then the tying into public policy because it seems to me there's a variety of public policy choices the government we could make to increase consumer choice hypothetically. So uh, an example of that would have been the FTC not approving the merger between Instagram and Facebook. So I will ask this to you first and then push it to you, Rachel. To what degree are you jumping the gun a bit on the idea that public choice, public policy doesn't affect the choices we have? Um... I, I don't think I would go so far as to say that. Um, instead, however, the individual choices of Rachel's friends, perhaps, to use Facebook, even if she doesn't like it, um, doesn't seem like an appropriate issue to be solved by policy. Um, a lack of availability of other alternatives would be some other question, but mere emergent patterns of private use, that's something else. But I think it is it is a choice, right? We, we have ended up here again, and I come back consistently to this notion of scale. All of these content moderations don't matter at all to me, except that they're done at a scale that I think distorts our social order and distorts how we consume information. And that has been a public policy decision. Um, you know, we talk, we use the term Facebook, we talk about Facebook, but what we're really talking about is Facebook and Instagram and WhatsApp and all the properties which Facebook owns, which control speech. That, again, has a choice. These, this, these companies have scaled up as a result of a lack of scrutiny by our antitrust enforcers. I would argue that the reason competitors really don't emerge in any viable way, particularly to Google and Facebook, is because they are effectively monopolies. Now, we will disagree with that characterization, but they are under antitrust scrutiny because of this. So this is a place for public policy to act. And I don't mean, I want to be very clear about what I do not mean, is that the government to come in and dictate you know, what can be said and what can't be said and the heavy hand of, you know, a clear moderation policy dictated by, you know, a whole host of, you know, congressmen that are constantly tweaking it and changing it. Again, I'm, I would be happy for these platforms to do all the content moderation in whatever the way they want if there was a plurality and a competitive marketplace. If you were able to compete a lot of these speech concerns away by going to a platform that had equal sort of competitive power to Facebook and Google, that does not exist, and that has been a, a very significant choice. Free markets are a reflection of the policy choices that we make. And this has been one, I think, where there's been very little oversight. I want to pull out your example of Facebook's monopoly, because to me, this seems to be an argument where you can argue where the market is naturally solving for this. So for example, separate from the national security concerns over TikTok, it is quite clear that TikTok is defeating Facebook when it comes to the Reels attempt. It's very clear that Facebook has not has struggled to product innovate the last several years. Um, Clubhouse is a new social media. It's a new social audio app, which Facebook is attempting to clone, but I would bet money is not being particularly successful. And I would also say that as a millennial, um, I spend literally zero time on Facebook. I deleted my I deleted it from my app, and a lot of the data shows that that's actually true as well. So is it possible that this issue is quote unquote solving itself as the internet moves away from 2010's practices and habits? So the issue with Facebook in particular, and the reason it's under antitrust investigation by 46 state attorneys general, so this is not just a couple of conservatives you know, railing about Facebook, it's 46 state attorneys general, is not that they aren't subject to competition, it's that whenever they are, they purchase that competition. You know, They buy, copy, kill is the mantra that Facebook has allegedly used. Uses. And you've seen this in every way. This is why they own Instagram and that merger is now under scrutiny. It's why they own WhatsApp. And again, the AGs are looking into that. And so it's this notion that, you know, if you want a vibrant competitive space on, you know, in the internet marketplace, you have to protect the small competitors. You have to allow them to actually compete with Facebook. Facebook is not receiving any actual competition. And if it is, it buys them. That's been its history. And so that's, 
the, the sort of core of the antitrust investigation against it. Slightly different issue than Google and the antitrust investigation there. But this is the key because antitrust enforcement is supposed to protect a competitive marketplace. It's not regulation, it's law enforcement. It is actually illegal to be a predatory monopoly in this country. And so whether or not Facebook has undertaken that, whether it's cut the legs out from its, its competitors and in doing so entrenched itself as the market incumbent is I think what actually needs to be examined. Because if we want Facebook subject to competitive forces, then there needs to actually be scrutiny to make sure they're competing. They're not just buying their way through the marketplace. So, first of all, I don't see the parts of Facebook as necessarily competing with one another, even if they were broken up or if they'd stayed independent. Uh, WhatsApp is a private chat client. Big Blue Facebook is a way for you to keep your family and high school friends in one place. And a lot of these acquisitions have created new markets and helped consumers. Was Oculus going to be market viable anytime soon when it was purchased by Facebook? Probably not, but they've sold it at a loss and created a whole new app market for developers to participate in. The same with Microsoft and the HoloLens on the commercial side. Or Google with Stadia creating a whole new market for cloud gaming that Amazon has tried to get into with Luna and failed. These platforms compete with one another in all sorts of ways all the time. Google is seen as a search giant. They, they have, they're completely dominant in general search. But then you have something like DuckDuckGo, which competes on privacy in a way that Google can't because of its business model, or Amazon and Etsy for shopping. Google would love to have more shopping searches, but increasingly those start and end within these separate walled gardens owned by Amazon or, or Etsy, an independent firm. Um, so across the board, you see, I think, tremendous competition. These firms have to keep moving to survive. They're always trying to pick at each other's businesses. You've seen from the attempted clones of everything from Snapchat to now Clubhouse to TikTok, which managed to crack mobile video when nobody else really could beforehand. Um, so I think this is a, a very live market. A, a follow-up to that, that would be in the areas you were describing, no one would claim that Facebook's monopoly has anything to do with Oculus or that Google's monopoly is in the hardware area um, or with video games, for example. So those weren't really the example Rachel we were discussing. So I think a good operationalized version of this question would be, would you, if you were commissioner of the FTC, would you allow Facebook to purchase Clubhouse right now? Well, probably not. Why? So there are limits. So why? Um, I, I mean, looking at the, the current landscape, um, I, don't know, I wouldn't prevent them from rolling out spaces, though, either, or whatever their their in, internal clubhouse clone is. But the key thing, though, is there's a bit of a difference between... So I guess, I guess the, question, the question I'm just getting at is, why would you not allow them to purchase clubhouse, though? I, I don't know. I'm sort of just putting myself in the shoes of an FTC person. So fair. Let's just put a terribly you know, good argument for that. Um, why, why, why would you would you allow it or would you not? <laughs> I, I think you allow it. I don't see them doing much with it, frankly. Um, I don't see people trusting it the same way if it were a, a Facebook product. I don't think people would necessarily want all of their Facebook friends or people they know on Instagram to suddenly show up in their, their clubhouse rooms. I think people value this separation. Um, we'll see how Facebook users respond long term to the, the kind of movement of Facebook properties into something bigger. Um, people have left Oculus and WhatsApp over this, moving again to competitors like Signal or Wire. I could guess what your answer will be, Rachel, but let's hear it. <laughs> well, I want to go back to something that Will said about Oculus, and he said, you know, what, had, what would have happened to it if Facebook didn't purchase it? And I think that's an unknowable thing, right? Because none of these mergers have undergone scrutiny. Over the last 20 years, there's been something of over 700 mergers and acquisitions in the digital space. None of them have received antitrust scrutiny. And again, it goes back to this idea of creating or, or policing the marketplace to make sure it is free and fair. So the things that we do know, though, is that after every major antitrust action in America, there has been vibrancy that's followed that. There's, you know, and people will disagree about this, but there's a fair amount of intellectual and academic research on after AT&T, after the breakup of AT&T, you had the birth of the modern internet. After, you know, the Microsoft settlement created in a lot of ways room for Google. 
Um, Microsoft itself benefited from antitrust action against IBM. So again, I reject characterizations of antitrust enforcement as somehow this like regulatory behemoth. No, the regulatory behemoth is what you get when you don't get antitrust enforcement. David Boies, who is the attorney that represented the government in the Microsoft case, has argued this actually very eloquently, that what happened in Europe to Microsoft, the big tech regime, regulatory regime that followed, was because there actually wasn't sufficient antitrust um, structural reform here in the United States. They didn't break up Microsoft. They, engage, they you know, issued a settlement that changed his behavior. Now, we can quibble about that, but he makes a fairly good case for it. And that is why, as a conservative, where I don't want a giant regulatory scheme to come down on these companies, I do think that making sure the marketplace is, is one of actual competition, where, you're at, where you don't just have these you know, three established incumbents blocking out new entrants or, you know, keeping the entrants at limited market share. Because again, it's not illegal to be a monopoly. There are natural monopolies, monopolies that form constantly. What antitrust law is concerned with is durability. And in Google's case, when you've had dominant market share, 90% market share for going on a decade and no new market entrants that have gotten over 5% of the market, that deserves some scrutiny. Because again, we want to police our markets to make sure they're free and fair and people are competing on the merits, not just competing to be bought. As we're nearing the audience period, I think there are two main questions, one for each of you that we are getting that sums up a lot of the things that we're seeing here. So we'll start with you, Mr. Duffield. Despite everything that you said very eloquently, I'm sure there are persons in the audience who just don't feel as if the status quo is fair to them. They don't feel as if these moderation decisions are made in good faith, and they just do not feel and in many ways may know that their perspective just doesn't matter as much to a company. A company, I could easily see a situation where a conservative would feel where they would not be as treated um, by a tech platform to the same degree of fairness as a Black Lives Matter activist would. So what would you just say to them in terms of assuaging their fears for their ability to speak and act and participate in our democracy long-term? Like why should someone who holds these concerns I have, I have relatives who have you know less than a, like 300 followers on Twitter, but they feel this is not a safe place for them. What would you say about the next 10 years that should give them hope? I think we're going to see a move away from centralized, capturable platforms. Bias aside, if something is big enough, if enough speech moves through it, it's going to be a tempting target for civic society actors, for regulators, for foreign states. And so that scenario in which we have these incredibly important nodes which speech must flow through is unsustainable or will at the very least always invite conflict around these, these choke points as people seek to capture them. But already the internet is moving away from that. New sorts of services, uh, decentralized services, things like library, IPFS, Urbit are built on the principle that you ought to own, if not your data, your digital identity. That ought to be something durable that you aren't dependent upon someone else to use or maintain, and you can take with you and choose who you engage with. Graft your own moderation product on top of it. And even many of the platforms which we're so worried about, who we see as having dominant power, see this as the future because they're upset about being beaten around by anyone and everyone seeking to influence their moderation or push them in one way or no, another. Twitter has been funding and working on a proposal called Blue Sky, which would essentially render the current Twitter firm a client that you use to access an underlying decentralized social graph, which includes all of the tweets, everyone's unfiltered, roiling mass of speech. But if you access it through the Twitter client, some of it may be limited as, as Twitter wants to. However, perhaps you can access that underlying feed through the parlor client, in which that sort of thing isn't limited, but maybe pornography is, or you don't have Antifa imposters. And so everyone can then find a product that fits their needs, gives them what they want, without controlling the whole underlying universe of speech. And that will be a better way forward for everyone. Uh, a quick follow-up, um, and then we'll get to Ms. Bovard, but it seems as if you're describing a world where 
if you are not center left to left, you basically don't have the ability to gather with people who you don't already know or who you don't have some sort of complicated tech stack put together. That just seems hard for me because it seems like I suspect a lot of conservatives like operating in the mainstream. And it just feels as if you're describing a world where that mainstream won't be accessible to them. I think it's a world without any one mainstream at all. I think there are lots of people across the political spectrum, on the left especially, who have issues with how Twitter is governed, who lose their accounts regularly. What they say is deemed harassment or trolling. And so they'd like an alternative as well. Uh, so I don't think this is, is cut and dried. I don't think conservatives are, are the only ones who see bias in mistakes at scale, constant mistakes, algorithmic mistakes, human mistakes, a deluge of them. Uh, when you're managing, what is it, 2.8 billion users, when all of them are speaking you know, hundreds of times a day, and, and you have you know, billions hundreds of millions of decisions every day to make, even if you're 99.9% accurate in, in figuring out what speech you want to remove, what shouldn't be removed, you're still going to have millions of false positives, millions of people who lose their Twitter account, lose their Facebook account every day, just as a kind of cost of doing business at scale. And I don't think that scenario is very palatable to anyone right now, but it is what we've ended up with in trying to have communication at scale and manage it in some sense. And Ms. Bovard, the question for you is you've picked, you've really, I think, pushed the um, resolution with the discussion of democracy and the stakes. So the question is, you've, you've diagnosed what you see as the problem. What are you actually asking to be done? Are you asking that Amazon be forced to keep Ryan Anderson's book on the shelves? Are you asking that private actors no longer be able to allow determine who or who isn't allowed in their club? But paints your articulation of the vision that doesn't, I think, go against many of the concerns more traditional conservatives could have for government interference. I think that something Will said is very important in that we do not want, I think, a mandate for these companies to have to host you know, certain content or other content. At the end of the day, these are still private actors. However, I do fear that they are colluding with the government in very dangerous ways. The government is now, and I should be specific, certain politicians are using these companies to enforce against speech in ways that would be unconstitutional if the government was doing it, but they've outsourced that activity to these companies. And the reason is scale. And so what I'm asking for as a public policy matter is that these companies are, are limited in scale because I do think that there are antitrust cases to be made. I want a vibrant marketplace in tech. I want these firms to have to compete aggressively on these issues. And I think, well, antitrust doesn't address speech concerns necessarily. I think if you had a marketplace in tech, a lot of these speech concerns could be competed away. And that way, speech is downstream from antitrust. If you enforce against them, you could create a competitive and dynamic space. So I think aggressive antitrust enforcement is step one. Now, we've talked briefly about Section 230, and, and Will is an expert on this law. And I think there's a lot of dangerous ways you can go with it. Um, and Democrats definitely want to do that. So to his point about Democrats being in charge, I think there's limited availability to address this issue. But I do think conservatives have strong ideas with which to do so. Section 230 is created by the government. It is a government structure around you know, an industry, around a business model. And so the government is a stakeholder in this argument. The government has a role to step in and say, how do we create more speech here? Democrats want to create less. They want to use it as a cudgel to create less. So how do we create more? There are a number of proposals to do this. Now, Josh Hawley is usually held up as the poster child for how this is done. I disagree with a lot of what he's put forward. I think that there are more narrow approaches. The Department of Justice has suggested tweaks that enforce a more First Amendment a friendly way that gives these companies less discretion with which to, to moderate speech under Section 230 protections. But I think that's an important area of policy that I hope will get a lot of debate uh, you know, in the coming years. But I think those two areas, and then I, say, I would say finally, you know, how we address data privacy and data portability in this market is something that I think is just untested. We, we know we are, these companies have grown at such a scale and have such metric tons of data on us in a way that our laws just don't, haven't caught up to. And so I they do think there should be a robust discussion of what it is that we do, what, what it is we allow these companies to do with that data, and if we actually have a say in it. 
a question I'd like to get your response to is Mr. Duffield's articulation of the idea that we actually see Rui promising seeds of a future decentralized technology, signal what, you know, not, not WhatsApp, but signal other forms of decentralized applications. What do you think about that vision? I was very encouraged by it until Parler. I do think Parler is a canary for what is going to happen to any sort of alternative at which conservatives gather. Because I think Democrats and I think those sort of mainstream corporation, the, the ideological direction of mainstream corporations have been very clear that they do not want conservatives gathering and speaking in certain areas. So we, can, we will be chased around the internet by this sort of progressive ideology until we no longer exist. And so where I think we're actually heading is not just sort of build your own app, build your own Facebook. We are literally building our own internet build your own infrastructure, build your own uncancelable stack. That is the solution to this, I think. I think it is a very distressing one for democracy because I think it is creating a situation in which you have no consensus, no dialogue, no communication at cross purposes or otherwise. You have two countries literally existing in one geographic entity. And I do not think that is sustainable for a self-government or a representative democracy, which is why I would rather see something that reduces the scale of these dominant players and creates a robust and diverse marketplace that supports diversity of views across the market. If, if I could just jump in on um, regulatory solutions in areas in which the government has intervened or put its thumb on the scale, I'd suggest that we repeal or at least reform the CFAA, the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. Because if we're concerned about data portability and we're willing to uh, think about things like the Access Act, which would mandate a certain amount of portability. Well, the current status quo criminalizes, like federally criminalizes, violations of terms of service, which uh, are used to exfiltrate data or access data that, that was beyond a user's granted permission. And this is an old law back from late 80s, I think, uh, fears of hackers when that movie was new. Um, but it's been used by dominant firms to go after and, and allege you know, criminality on the, the part of those who've tried to create an alternative that would allow users to take their profile elsewhere. Uh, Facebook v. Power Ventures um, concerned a startup that tried to create a sort of meta social media, which you could log into with your Facebook and your Twitter and would aggregate everything together. And Facebook went after them using this law. I think if we want to encourage uh, cross compatibility and competition, the first thing we should think about doing is just taking that government thumb off the scale there. Yeah, look, I think that there are a number of areas that we can touch on. That is one in particular. One I didn't mention that I think Governor Ron DeSantis is sort of test driving a little bit in Florida is this idea of deceptive practices. Right? Can these companies present themselves as one thing while in fact doing another? How much transparency and accountability should we require to their terms of service? Um, that is something I think that is a creative approach that is, is being discussed. But I think a lot of this is iterative. A lot of this is we are learning as we go. Our public policy is trying to deal with a problem we've never seen before. And so a lot of approaches that have been proposed you know, have been scrapped now. Um, and I think we're looking at new approaches. We're constantly tailoring what we're doing because people recognize, I think, across the spectrum that this is new and must be dealt with. You know, that is, it is a threat to how our social order is being defined. So public policy is actually appropriate response because it is how we, as a country, decide how we want to live together, how we want to engage with these corporations and require them to engage with us. And then the last question before we get to audience questions, um, to what degree do you believe the status quo is natural? And to what degree is that also just a result of government choices to Rachel's point? I think if you didn't have the, the 230 that was legislated, you would have by now ended up with something similar through the courts. Um, there are a lot of complaints about the way in which Section 230 has been interpreted, complaints that has been expanded beyond its original bounds, but all of that expansion or recognition was in line with the existing case law that, that led up to it. Um, you look back to cases surrounding booksellers' liability, and they, they were long excluded from liability for what they carried on their shelves so long as they didn't have a 
particular knowledge of something illegal that, that they'd stalked. Um, so I think we were moving towards a 230 world before it was passed. And it, it really, um, a New York judge threw a, a spanner in the works with a very bad decision about um, Stratton Oakmont, um, the firm later of Wolf of Wall Street fame, um, which sued Prodigy when a, a user alleged that um, Stratton Oakmont was a big fraud. Um, and in this case, Stratton Oakmont won, but that that punishment of, of Prodigy for failing to police this claim um, was what birthed 230. And I think courts sort of recognized that that was an erroneous ruling um, in any case. Now, I do worry about a, a post-230 world in that were we to, to legislatively move away from or, or repeal it, um, courts would respond to that. It wouldn't just be a, a kind of uh, in, interpretation from tabula rasa again. So this is the perfect point to get to our audience questions. Thank you very much to everyone who participated. Okay, so I will throw this to you first, Ms. Bovard. Is there anything that private citizens can do to counteract the threat of big tech? Or is government intervention the only possible solution? Then we'll throw it to you after. So I think this has been an evolving answer because in a traditional sense, you can just depart and not use the business that you don't like. That is not actually a possibility anymore with companies like Google. You've, you cannot opt out of Google if you live in the modern world. And this is something I think that is distressing to people like me who want to distangle myself from Google, but effectively cannot because I have a phone <laughs> and all the apps, you know, run Google. Um, and Google is built into basically every site on the internet. Google ads are tracking you across the internet. So, you know, I think it is very difficult for citizens to do what we normally do, which is to just avoid the businesses that we don't like. Um, I do think to the extent that we support and use alternative services, we should. It doesn't address my problem of scale, however, which is that I, I may not be using Facebook, but because it is so dominant, everyone else is. And so the network effects of Facebook are changing the information, changing the viewpoints of the people around me in ways that I think are completely unaccountable. You know, and I would also say the way in which to support our smallest alternatives, for instance, when we're looking at Google search, Right? We can use DuckDuckGo, but we should ask ourselves, why has DuckDuckGo never been able to crack more than 2% of the market as competitive, you know, if, if there is a true free market? We need to be curious about these questions as conservatives. We traditionally have not been. We've said the free market will solve for all problems because when it's working correctly, the free market does solve for all problems. But in this case, I would assert there is not a market. And so our best case is to use alternatives, to, but to be curious about the market as it is. And I think we need to be asking our public policy makers tough questions about that. So firstly, there's, there's very much a market in these spaces. <laughs> Parler, after leaving AWS, went and found another web host. And there are hundreds of web hosts out there. They used Epic as their domain name registrar. Epic has become kind of the go-to registrar for right-wing sites knocked off other domain name registrars, of which there are hundreds. Um, as far as what you can do out there to fight big tech, um, launch an Urbit ship. This sounds wild, like just a, a strange set of words stuck together, but it's a very exciting full stack alternative proposal um, for really giving users control over their, their social media. Um, you could do something similar with Mastodon or Pleorma to federated social media services. You could also just create your own website you still have that uh, blogging, maybe seeing a, a little bit of a, a return, certainly nothing like it's, it's heyday, but I think there's a lot of interest in these sorts of things. Substack has, has blown up. Um, so find a, a couple friends and, and build something. It, it might not be for everyone, it won't scale, but not every alternative needs to. You can have something that you know will be there as a fallback for you and your friends, and you'll learn more about the internet and how all of this works and how difficult it is to manage any kind of social space online uh, as a result. Um, Ms. Bovert spoke of surveillance capitalism, of this situation where we have a seemingly privatized 
social credit system, is the status quo compatible with liberty? Yes. Um, you know, certainly there's, there's a lot of private governance at the moment, um, perhaps more than we had three or four years ago when we'd gotten these platforms really at, at scale, um, but hadn't imposed as much governance on them. Nevertheless, there's still far more ways to speak, communicate, transact than we've had before. And I think that's a great boon to liberty. Um, people have more ways to collaborate, work with one another, sell each other things, meet partners, et cetera, than, than they've been able to in the past. Um, and expecting everyone to uh, you know, avoid using something that is intermediated merely because the intermediary attempts to govern it, um, well, we, we don't all go back to you know, using stone hand tools because again, then we're reliant on the, the blacksmith or whoever else. Um, if we were to all rely on purely our own capacities all the time, our practical liberty would also be quite diminished. I think what Will said is correct. We can, big tech has given us a lot that has enhanced our definition of you know, liberty in the way that we live. The question though, for the classical understanding of liberty is at what cost? The classical understanding of liberty has always been we can act, we can live, we can engage with each other unmolested from coercion, whether it's from the state or I would argue from massive corporate power. That I do not think is our current status quo. I think you know we have we have accepted the benefits of big tech while being uh, remarkably uncurious as to what we are giving up and what is being done with all of the data about our daily lives, and I mean very granular data. The ability of these companies to create a profile, a very detailed profile about who we are, what we know, where we go, who we interact with, what we say, that is that is a cost to our liberty as we have always commonly understood it. And so much of this public policy debate is about this, about this consensus of what constitutes liberty. And I would assert, as I have you know, throughout this debate, that that is under threat. That it, it you know, especially when you know, corporate surveillance or power or however, however you want to define it of this magnitude is now colluding with the state, that is literally fascism. It's not Donald Trump getting up and taking a bath. That is not fascism. This is, you know, co corporate and government power working together is fascism. And so I would say that, you know, we haven't reached, I think, totally that point, but I do worry that we are going in a direction that we cannot come back from. The next question, which is an excellent one, which is, is it possible for social media platforms to conduct fact checks and shut down conspiracy theories without threatening free speech? Well, I think it depends on free speech as you understand it, right? If it's free speech simply to say whatever you want without, you know, subject to nothing, then the answer is no. Um, you know, free speech in America has always been a consensus. You know, there's all kinds of checks. You know, the First Amendment is not un unfettered, <laughs> to use the New York Times phrase, um, but it does have limits. And so I would say the answer is, is again, no. But this again goes back, I keep coming back to this idea of scale, because again, what Facebook chooses to do and what it chooses to fact check and how would matter far less if it wasn't the dominant speech platform for many people. Same with Google. If what it decides to amplify or suppress based on its own decisions would matter far less if its ramifications weren't for 90% of the country. So scale here is my issue. I would feel much more comfortable with these companies making these choices if you know you could hop on over to an equally or competitive dominant platform uh, and be able to say the same thing. Quick follow-up. Do you think platforms, regardless of the competitive market, then have a responsibility to fact check or to shut down conspiracy theories? I do not think that they have a responsibility necessarily to fact check in the aggressive way they are now. Um, I think going back to actually a Section 230 conversation, I think this there's an argument that this actually makes them a content creator. You know, and then they are now subject, you know, this was the argument that Justice Clarence Thomas laid out recently coming down to the Supreme Court. You know, whether or not they should be able to do that with Section 230 protection is an ongoing public policy question. So whether or not they have the responsibility to do it, I think is a, is a question for policymakers at the end of the day, uh, because policymakers are the one that sets the limits for you know, what we as a society decide is acceptable or not. So first on, on section 230 and fact checks, whenever Twitter adds its own speech to a tweet, they append something, stick it over top, 
They don't have any 230 protection for that because it is their speech. They've written it. They've put it out there. It's not someone else's content they're retransmitting. Uh, so they are and, and are being sued right now, I think, by the fellow who discovered Hunter Biden's laptop in the shop um, on, on the argument being that um, in labeling that story, uh, the dissemination of hacked materials, Twitter essentially called him a hacker and he suffered reputational harm from this. So Twitter will have to fight that out in the court. I don't think they'll get and shouldn't get 230 protection for that sentiment um, because it's theirs. Um, more generally, I don't think there's any duty to fact check. I think that, that fact checking generally um, ser serves to add more speech and therefore isn't a, a threat to speech. However, when you're, you're reducing the distribution of content on the basis of it having been fact checked, um, that's, that's something else. But it is less platform power than, I don't know, um, a, a deal or, or concession um, to the old gatekeepers handed by, by the new. Um, because for the most part, these platforms don't rely upon their own expertise, their own sense of what is correct um, to make these fact checks. They outsource them to third parties. And in, in my mind, and I've written about this before, this often ends up undermining the legitimacy of the platform's governance because they're then outsourcing their reputation for finding fact or discerning error to whoever this third party expert may be. And last spring, when it was the WHO and CDC about whether or not you ought to wear a mask, because the experts that Twitter and Facebook relied upon said, no, you don't need a mask. Twitter and Facebook said, oh, the fact check is you don't need a mask. And so the fact check, the attempt to surface truth over falsity, ended up spreading a falsity much more widely than it otherwise would have traveled because the platform empowered or, or picked um, the, the CDC and WHO advice as, as expertise. Um, so I think platforms need to be very careful with their legitimacy and reputations um, when they, they hand out, hand off those sorts of pretty important decisions. So to the original question then, is it possible that we could have a world where fact-checking isn't as controversial as it is today? Is it possible that with a few years, maybe of political toning down, is, 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 is the controversy with fact-checking inherent to the medium, well, or is it? Yes, but it won't be fact-checking that gives uh, current proponents of fact-checking what they want. If fact-checking is seen as, as a means of preventing the demos from receiving misinformation, then you're always going to have those sorts of nasty conflicts about it. Um, if instead it's, it's something more personal, you're, you're picking your fact checker or editor based on your own priorities and, and perhaps concerns, you're more worried about certain truths than others, um, then it can become a much more individuated phenomenon and something that's less a cause for, for political fights about how we're all being fact checked. Another great question. How do you understand, and this is for you, Mr. Duffield, how do you understand the idea of a monopoly as it pertains to these digital communications platforms? Can the legal definition of monopoly be applied to these platforms? And just to add something to that um, in my pre-questions is the reference to Twitter. So for example, Twitter is not quite a monopoly under many of the standard legal definitions. It isn't dominant in advertising the way that Google and Facebook are. So when we use terms like monopoly, but we also relate the fact that a lot of speech and a lot of very important speech happens on those platforms. How do we bring all these concepts together in a coherent way? Yeah, so I would have difficulty deeming Twitter a monopoly merely because elites have ended up using it. Um, that, that would seem, frankly, a definition that, that leaves little agency with, with Twitter to determine what it is and, and kind of just um, you end up with, a, a, well, whatever your users choose determines what, what you are. Um, I think monopoly turns on, on the availability of alternatives, and I don't think I see any of these services in which there aren't three or four perfectly viable alternatives. Um, so I, I don't see any of them as monopolies in that sense. I think the closest you might get would be Google vis-a-vis -vis general search. Um, but. Even there, just defining what your search market or general search versus discrete search market looks like 
becomes very difficult. What about the search within arms list for guns or Etsy for knit sweaters? So outside of the Google example that you've spoken about a bit, how would you think the idea of monopoly applies to the examples of Twitter discourse, the public square dynamic? So I don't think Twitter is a per se monopoly. I don't think it has the market share that meets that definition. It's it's the sm- has the smallest user base. I do think you know taking setting aside the issue of an actual monopoly. I do think where Twitter has massive amounts of power is in is in sort of narrative construction, because to the point that Will made, that's where the elites hang out. <laughs> that's there was a Neiman Lab study that mentioned you know, Twitter's place in the link economy is small but extremely powerful because it drives the news. You know what people talk about on Twitter is what is then covered. You know, in the mainstream media, Axios after the election said it's dominate or part of its newsroom will not be dedicated to covering social media because what is said on social media is now going to drive news. So that's where I think Twitter has an outsized influence on the national conversation. Is it a monopoly under our laws? I don't think so. Um, but I do think that Google and Facebook meet the threshold test on a num- on, on a couple of areas. I've talked already about where Facebook, the investigation against Facebook is ongoing. But with Google in particular, it's a very targeted suit against its ad monopoly, its digital ad monopoly. And this uh, is a marketplace where Google is both the, you know, buyer, the middleman, and the purchaser of ads across the market. It's a, it's a very uh, opaque, non-transparent uh, marketplace for digital ads. And when you have a functioning marketplace, one thing it requires is a little bit or a lot of information symmetry. And the government's case against Google is that that does not exist. And Google uses that in a predatory manner. Um, I'd urge you to read the case, uh, DOJ versus Google. It is actually uh, very straightforward. Um, and that's a good sign for an antitrust case is where it's a very easy case to make. Um, but it's focused primarily on Google's ad markets and the specific acts that Google takes uh, to keep out its competitors. So our next question is, how can we ensure the right of private businesses to refuse service while also simultaneously punishing or prohibiting censorship by big tech actors that dominate the marketplace? Man, you guys are just throwing us hard questions. (laughs) Yeah. So I think that this, again, you know, my biggest objection again is that there's only three big players in the market so they get to decide kind of how the rest of us live and that wouldn't be the case if you had a competitive space if you had other 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 other, i think other actual equitable players but i do think that this is an interesting question because it goes again to terms of service and how much of a stake does the government have in that conversation about what these government what how these companies get to moderate their content who they get to kick off and why because the government has made public policy choices that have benefited these companies, and by that I mean Section 230, which is a direct benefit, the government has a stake in this question. Um, and I would also say our lack of antitrust enforcement, though that's not sort of a positive step, um, they have a say in how this is done. And you know, again, I think a lot of the Section 230 arguments, they get conflated with the First Amendment itself. They, Section 230 gets like put in the same level as the Constitution, and it's just not true. It exists separate and apart from that. It was a government act. And so the government has some ability to say, how, if we're going to privilege you in this regard, we can, you know, make, lay out certain criteria by which you earn this privilege. And companies who choose not to abide by that criteria are not being punished. They're simply making a choice. So I think that is one area where I think the government, you know, can sort of control this conversation a little bit. And the second is something I mentioned earlier, which is the sort of um, Deceptive Practices Act. Senator Mike Lee has talked about this, whether you know the, the, the FTC has a role in saying, you've presented, your, presented yourself as, what does Twitter CEO say, or their chief operating officer, the free speech wing of the free speech party, but in reality, you, know, you, you plan to do other things. You cannot actually do that under our consumer protection laws uh, in any number of ways. And so I think that is another area where public policy has a role here. Do you really see unfair and deceptive practices as capturing like off the cuff speech by an executive in 2012, in spite of the fact that Twitter has robust terms of service describing all of the things which aren't allowed on Twitter? I I just, it seems tough to to really view that as as deception. Um, But I think that's uh, eloquent in its brevity. Um, <laughs> so we have three last questions here. I think we can get through them if we keep them 
So when we just moderate is privilege, 30 second answers max for these three questions. Um, so Mr. Duffield, how do insights from public choice theory inform our willingness or reticence to have the federal government regulate the actions of private companies? Um, I, I think it should should cause us to be much more reticent, um, particularly looking at how some of these dominant firms have now turned to support regulation, which they're able to comply with, but their competitors aren't. It feels like a classic public choice story when you see first the, the Honest Ads Act proposed, Facebook come up with a, a private compliant system trying to head off the bill um, while opposing it, but then once they have that system, flipping to support it because at that point it would advantage them. I think Will makes an excellent point that you do not want to create regulation that benefits or entrenches the current market incumbents at the expense of smaller. That is something that can be controlled for. And I think as we iterate this public policy debate, you see more and more lawmakers recognizing that fact, that any public policy choice they make must be nuanced enough to protect the, in the small innovators you know, while sort of providing more accountability and transparency on the bigger actors. Excellent job on time, everyone. Um, two more. As a matter of policy, is there a way we can determine when a private corporation's decision to regulate speech along ideological lines falls afoul of free speech norms? So this is something that I think is less a matter of public policy as written now than it is our social consensus. Um, this is just a question for us as a society. You know, free speech is not a set of axioms. It's an ever evolving consensus. And this is one of those times. So what it is that we decide as a society free speech will mean uh, and what we want it to mean is how we will now iterate our public policy. This is a question for us speaking through our self-government. The left has made very clear what it is that they want. And the right has, answer has always been the answer to bad speech is not censorship. It is more speech. So how our public policy iterates on that fact will determine the next 10 years of how we speak to each other online. Uh, I would say private actions that restrict free speech are a violation of free speech when a government actor demands them. And our last question, what, and actually this is good to start with you because um, Ms. Bovard alleged this a couple times, what do you make of accusations that Google and other big tech companies effectively manipulate public opinion on a host of issues through manipulated search queries and results? I, I've seen no evidence of it. There are some very bad studies from a fellow named Dr. Richard Epstein in which he excluded all results that came from Gmail accounts on the grounds that those results were themselves manipulated. Um, more broadly, were, were this true? Were platforms doing this at, at scale? I think we'd see, one, people thinking more highly of them um, because they have reputationally done quite poorly recently. Um, and, and more of their priorities uh, being realized um, in, in the political realm. Um, so far, over the past, what, four years, they've just been beaten around by everybody and, and gotten nothing that they've wanted, uh, which doesn't, to me, uh, belie a, a high level of secretive control over things behind the scenes. So there's a great uh, Wall Street Journal investigation that came out, I believe, in September of last year that, it's, go read it, it's called How Google Changes Your Search Results. And a lot of this is content moderation by Google, but it does have downstream effects. In that article, it looked at how Google uh, modifies search results around inflammatory terms like abortion, like immigration, how it prioritizes search results for big business over small, how it self-preferences its own products. All of these things, again, because Google is so dominant, because so many people use it, are changing the information that you know the vast majority of people see, the viewpoints they are exposed to, the businesses they can find. I would argue that does change things. Thank you. And thank you, everyone, for these really excellent questions. I was glad that we could make it all the way through. We are now going to transition to our three-minute max closing statements, beginning with Mr. Duffield. OK. Um, so the, the market works, but it doesn't always work immediately. However, the current legal status quo has continued to allow the market to serve speech, host speech, unwanted elsewhere. Parler's deplatforming by AWS was a wake-up call to conservatives who hadn't previously paid attention to the downsides of centralized infrastructure. It's already channeled interest and capital towards alternatives. Uh, one that was written about recently called RightForge already claims to have 33 million users and processes hundreds of millions of dollars in transactions. 
as well, there were already services like um, Epic uh, that came in to pick up Parler when they'd been kicked off Amazon. Um, so that, that status quo is working. Not everything happens overnight. Rome wasn't built in a day. Um, but we're seeing a process by which complaints and concerns about the behavior activities of mainstream platforms have created new niches and opportunities that are in real time being filled by new upstart competitors. Um, functioning markets keep barriers to entry low. We've seen this in, in 230 in this space. When Amazon withdrew service, there were hosts of other domain registrars and web hosts that, that could step up. So this is very much a functioning market. The legal status quo is working, even if we don't like the current dominant firms and their decisions, we're able to move through that, move away from that. And there are a host of alternatives that are being created right now, which rather than relying on any singular centralized server or service, are designed to make centralized moderation difficult, if not impossible. And that really is, is the one way that we'll get out of this system or, or circular political firing squad of, of everyone trying to push these capturable centralized platforms to their point of view. I'm going to save us maybe a couple minutes and make mine very brief, but I premised or I summarized this quote earlier from Roger Scruton, which is that freedom is not a set of axioms, it is a constantly evolving consensus. And I think that is the umbrella under which a lot of this conversation is happening. We are seeing corporate power uh, being exercised at a scale we have never seen before in America or around the world. How we respond to this is going to define how we live together. And I very much feel and the right is divided on this question, but the corporate power of this magnitude can be a threat to liberty, even more so when, as we are seeing now, it is weaponized by politicians and government actors to enforce censorship by other means. Censorship done at the behest of the government, but not by the government. This changes the way we live together. This changes the flow of information. This changes what viewpoints we see. It changes the nature of free speech as we've always known it. Now, I agree that the free market can and does solve problems, and I want the free market to solve this one. I do not believe that the free market is actually working here. A handful of small firms you know, in dusty corners of the internet, in my mind, does not constitute a robust, thriving marketplace, particularly when, again, these dominant firms have been durable for so long, when they've purchased all the market entrants uh, and when they've punished others. And so I would say that we have gotten to this place by a specific set of choices. Those choices have been acted upon and, or by us through our self-government. Our public policy must now respond, and that is not a function of big government. It should not be a function of big government, but where antitrust laws are being broken, we should enforce against them. Where the government has already acted to privilege these, these uh, big actors, we should change that criteria if we so choose. That is not a suppression of speech. That is a privileging of specific corporations and asking them for something in return. So I very much think we are at a watershed moment for what speech, what freedom looks like in America. Um, and I hope and I pray that we get it right. Thank you, Ms. Bovard. So we actually have two minutes left. So to wrap this all up, I'll ask one final question to the two of you. Firstly, what do you think the world will look like in five years if your optimistic take on this resolution continues forward? We'll, we'll have more new decentralized social media platforms. The big boys will still be there. People will still have reason to use them. Sometimes you may want convenience rather than control. But for those who desire control, you'll be able to have a lot more of it. And that'll generally be a better situation that take some of the pressure and conflict off speech and moves it back to people's behavior and actions where I think it belongs. I think we'll have a market state. I don't think we will have a democracy as we now understand it. I think we will have a fusion of government and corporate power that is not a sort of self-government, it is a market state. Um, I think we will have a social credit system that is run by corporations well, it's not very optimistic, but that's what I think is going to happen. <laughs> that was specific to you. Hers is the pessimism section. Oh, so oh, we are okay. fulfilling our uh, expectations of the final bit here. 
Um, well, on that very unoptimistic note, I wanted to say a huge thank you to the two of you for joining us all for this debate. A huge thank you to the audience for the excellent questions. I was very happy we could make it through. And most importantly, a thank you to the Diana Davis Spencer Foundation for making this event and so many more possible. Have a great evening and please stay tuned for the next event in the Diana Davis Spencer debate series. Thank you.